and ignorance of the doctrine of regeneration. My dear friends, and I'm going to say this bluntly, I know that there are Calvinists here, and I know that there are Arminians here, and I know that there are all sorts of strange animals in between. But I want you to know this. Although I am leaning more toward, I, I guess I call myself a five-point Spurgeonist, I want you to know this. Calvinism is not the issue. No, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble when this goes on the Internet. Calvinism is not the issue. I'll tell you what the issue is. Regeneration. And that is why I can have fellowship with Wesley and Ravenhill and Tozer and all the rest. Because regardless of where they stood on the other issue, they believed that salvation could not be manipulated by the preacher. That it was a magnificent work of the power of Almighty God. And with them, therefore, I stand. That it was a work of God. There is a greater manifestation of the power of God in the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit than in the creation of the world, of the universe, because He created the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, but He recreates a man out of a corrupt mass. It is paralleled with the very resurrection of our Savior from the dead. If you are a preacher, I understand that in preaching there is teachers and preachers and expositors and this and that and all of them are very necessary for the health of the church. But uh, you must understand this. As O.G. Campbell Morgan, I've heard of him that when he would go up that majestic tower to preach, he would quote to himself, as a lamb led to the slaughter, as a sheep for his shears. He knew that a part of from a magnificent manifestation of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, everything He said would be death. But it is the Spirit that gives life. And in that sense, every one of us who proclaim must proclaim as a prophet. What do I mean by that? We are always, we are always Ezekiel. Standing in that valley of dry bones, and they are very dry. And we walk out there, and what do we do? We prophesy. We say, hear the word of the Lord. And we know that the wind of God must blow on these slain, or they will not rise again. And when you have fully grasped that in the innermost part of your being, you will no longer give yourself to the manipulation that is so often carried out in the name of evangelism in this country. You will proclaim the Word of God. You will proclaim it. The doctrine of regeneration Look at the Wesleys. Look what they had to face for a moment. And, my dear Whitfield, what was it? Everybody believed they were Christian. Thoroughly Christian. Why? Well, they were baptized as infants. Brought into the covenant. They were confirmed. They lived like devils. Regeneration was traded for a type of creedalism that was given authority by the religious leaders of the day. And then here comes the Wesleys. No, it is not right with your soul. You are not born again. There is no evidence of spiritual life. Examine yourself. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Make your calling and election sure. Ye must be born again here in America because of the last several years, several decades of evangelism. The idea of born again is totally lost. It only means that at one time in a crusade, you made a decision and you think you were sincere. But there's no evidence of a supernatural recreating work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If any man, not if some men, if any man 
be in Christ, he is a new creature. And now, it's the same today. What do we face? I'll tell you what we face. It's not a sort of infant baptism necessarily most of the time. It's not a high church confirmation by an ecclesiastical authority. What we face is the sinner's prayer. And I'm here to tell you, if there's anything I've declared war on, it's that. You say, Brother Paul, yes, in the same way that infant baptism, in my opinion, was the, was the golden calf of the Reformation, for the Baptists and the Evangelicals and everyone else who's followed them today, I'll tell you, that sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything on the face of the earth. You say, how can you say such a thing? Go with me to Scripture and show me, please. I, I would love you to stand up and tell me where anyone evangelized that way. The Scripture does not say that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel and said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, who would like to ask me into their hearts? I see that hand. It's not what it says. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Now men today are trusting in the fact that at least one time in their life they prayed a prayer and someone told them they were saved because they were sincere enough. And so in their salvation, if you ask them, are you saved? They do not say, yes, I am because I'm looking unto Jesus and there is mighty evidence giving me assurance of being born again. No, they say, one time in my life I prayed a prayer. And they live like devils. But they pray a prayer. And some of them, I heard of one evangelist who was coaxing a man to do that thing. Finally, the man felt so uncomfortable, the evangelist said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll pray to God for you. And if it's what you want to say to God, squeeze my hand. Behold the power of God. Decisionism. The idolatry of decisionism. Men think they're going to heaven because they have judged the sincerity of their own decision. When Paul came to the church in Corinth, he did not say to them, look, you're not living like Christians, so let's go back to that one moment in your life and when you prayed that prayer and let's see if you were sincere. No, he said this, test yourselves, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Because I want you to know, my friend, salvation is by faith alone. It is a work of God. It is a grace upon grace upon grace. But the evidence of conversion is not just your examination of your sincerity at the moment of your conversion. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. Oh, my dear friend, look what we've done. Is it a tree known by its fruit? What, 60, 70 percent of America thinks it's converted, born again? We kill how many thousands of babies a day? We're hated around the world for our immorality? Yet we're Christian? And I lay this squarely, the blame, at the feet of the preacher. Fifth indictment, an unbiblical gospel invitation. We've touched on it a bit. I want to go further. Look how we do it today. I mean, now, now listen to me. The more, I've seen this everywhere. The Calvinist, the Arminian, a lot of them share something in common. It is this, the same superficial invitation. They talk a lot of talk about a lot of things, and then they come to the invitation, and it's almost as though everyone loses their mind. Walk up to someone and says, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Can you imagine telling that to an American? Sir, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What? God loves me? Oh, well, that's great because I love me too. Oh, this is wonderful. And God's got a, a wonderful plan. i got a wonderful plan for my life too. And if I accept Him into my life, I'll have my best life now. This is absolutely wonderful. That is not biblical evangelism. Let me give you something in its place. 
God comes to Moses and he says this, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The reaction of Moses. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. Evangelism begins with the nature of God. Who is God? Can a man recognize anything about his sin? if he hath not a standard with which to compare himself. If we tell 